In this video, I want to talk about graphing radical functions, and I want to do that through the lens that radicals are the inverses to monomials. But even before that, I want to show us how can we actually compute the inverse of a one-to-one -one polynomial function. Now, not every polynomial function is going to be one-to-one. -one. We've seen many of them that are like, wow, like that. There's so many wiggles and turning points that, you know, there's going to be many places where it fails you know, the horizontal line test, something like that. So not every polynomial function is going to be one-to-one, -one, therefore it's not invertible, but there will be many that are. So for example, consider the function f of x equals 3x to the fifth plus 1, uh, which you can see that right here, 3x to the fifth plus 1. So looking at that graph f, um, this would be the, the standard the standard uh, y equals x to the fifth, which looks like an odd monomial. You have this type of shape right here. Uh, but there's been some transformations done to it, right? We've stretched it vertically by a factor of three. So it's three times as steep. So as you went from the vertex to the next point, you actually go three steps up instead of one step. You see that? Um, and then also it was shifted up by one. So instead of the vertex being at zero, zero, it's instead at the point zero comma one. So we have transformed this, uh, this graph right here. And I do want to summarize what we have here. So f of x equals 3x to the fifth plus 1. So we took our, as our basic graph, as the base, you take y equals x to the fifth. And then in terms of transformations, you stretch. I was going to write this way. You're going to stretch it vertically by a factor of 3, and you're going to shift it up by one unit. So that's the basic graph of this function right here. That's an important thing to keep track of. Now, we can see visually that the yellow graph is a one-to-one -one function. Like I said, it passes this horizontal line test at all locations in its domain. Since it's one-to-one, -one, it should have an inverse function. How do we compute this inverse function? Well, to compute the inverse function, we're going to use the technique that we developed previously. So we have our function y, well, f of x, we'll say that first, f of x equals 3x to the fifth plus 1. When you're trying to solve for the inverse function, what I want you to do is re replace the function notation with y, right? So y equals 3x to the fifth plus 1. And then I want you to switch the roles of x and y. So x becomes y and y becomes x. This then gives you that x is equal to 3y three, uh, three to the fifth, excuse me, plus 1. And then you need to proceed to solve for y. So to do that, I'd subtract 1 from both sides so that the 1 cancels on the left, on the right, excuse me. Uh, then we get 3x to the fifth is equal to x minus 1. We then perform the next inverse operation, which would be division by 3. Division by 3. So we end up with y to the fifth is equal to x plus 1 over 3. Or if you prefer, we're going to do 1 third x minus a third. You know, either one is perfectly fine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one you approach. I'm going to stick with the first one. And then how did, and so notice what we did each each time, right? So in the first example, we had this plus one. So we looked at all these numbers that were attached to the y. So there's a five that's attached to the y, there's a three that's attached to the y, there's a one that's attached to the y. And so in the morning when you put you when you get ready to go to class, you put your socks on, then your shoes, but then when you're done with the day, you take your shoes off, then your socks. The order of operations gets reversed. So you were first, you know, taught in, you know, grade school and such, you know, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, that when it comes to order of operations, we do whatever in parentheses first, then exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, right? There's this order of operation. When we do inverse operations, we do them backwards. So when you're reversing the process, you take your shoes off before your socks, addition becomes the first operation. And so you undo addition by subtracting. So the one is attached to the y via addition. So we undo it by subtracting one on both sides. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. And then you come down to the next one over here. Whoops. Um, we had this 3x to the fifth, right? 3 was attached to the y. How is it attached to the y? It's attached by multiplication. So to get rid of the 3, we're going to divide both sides by 3. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. We have to do it to the same thing to both sides of the equation to keep equality. We are dividing by 3 to cancel out the multiplication by 3. And so that gets us to the point we're at right now, this y to the fifth equals x minus 1 over 3. This is the important step here. Because in order to get rid of the 5, how do we get rid of the 5? We want to move the 5 to the other side of the equation, just like we did with the 1 and just like we did with the 3. Well, how do you move the 5 to the other side? Well, how is the 5 attached to the 
to the to the y there we have y exponent five that's the operation here this exponent this power so we get rid of the power of five by taking the power of the one fifth that is we're going to take the fifth root of both sides that's the inverse operation in play here so we need to take the fifth root of y and the fifth root on the right hand side this then gives us that y will equal the fifth root of x minus 1 over 3. And thus, this is our inverse function here. f inverse of x is equal to the fifth root of x minus 1 over 3. So the strategy is the same like we saw previously. In order to find the inverse function, you are going to uh, swap the x and y and then solve for the new y. And so the graph of this function, you can see now illustrated here on the screen. And as these are inverse functions, you should see with this reflection across the diagonal line, y equals x. Because all of these points will swap into, will swap their order. So you have this point right here of 0 comma 1. It's the y-intercept of the function. Y-intercepts will translate to become x-intercepts. You're going to switch the order around 1 comma 0 like that. Um, another point we mentioned on the graph right here, you have the point 1 comma 4. Well, when you switch to the inverse function, 1 comma 4 becomes the point 4 comma 1. All of the x and y coordinates get swapped around. Look at this point right here. Uh, that's, that's, that's not quite negative 1, uh, negative 1. But this is the points, the points on the diagonal, this diagonal y equals x, that's where these graphs are going to intersect each other. Because this is a place where the x and y coordinate are the same. So when you swap them around, nothing gets moved around. Another observation I want you to make here is let's think of this function in terms of transformations. What would the transformations be here? Well, in this situation, the base function, instead of being the monomial y equals x to the fifth, it's going to be y equals the fifth root of x. So they're inverse, the, the base functions are inverses of each other. But now notice all of the numbers are inside of the square root. And so if you're inside the square, uh, the fifth root, excuse me, if you're inside the radical, you're actually in the horizontal zone doo, 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 doo. and therefore everything in the horizontal zone will affect the x coordinates but it also will always affect things backwards so if you look at this three for example dividing by three actually stretches the function horizontally by a factor of three and subtracting one in the horizontal zone actually moves the graph in the positive direction which would, of course, be the right if we're talking about the positive horizontal direction. And so I want you to compare these things. What were the transformations? We stretched it vertically by 3 versus we stretched it horizontally by 3. It's the same thing except vertical turned into horizontal here. And then the original graph, we shifted in the positive direction by 1 vertically, which is what we mean by up. And then here, we shifted in the positive direction by 1 horizontally, which, of course, what we mean by right. In this context so the transformations are the same except we switch everything from vertical to horizontal and the other would also be true as we switch from a function to its inverse horizontal transformations turn into vertical transformations because vertical and horizontal are inverses of each other let's look at a slightly more involved example here take the function f of x equals 4x cubed plus 1 divided by 2x cubed minus 3. this would be a rational function um, I'm not going to graph this one, but you could you, you could put this in like desmos.com or something. You could see that this rational function would in fact be a one-to-one -one function. What we're going to do is I want to compute the inverse operation, the inverse function, which you're going to see is going to involve radicals. It's going to be the it's going to actually be the cube root of a rational function. The strategy for doing that is the exact same. So we start off with our function f of x equals 4x cubed plus 1 over 2x cubed minus 3. I want you to realize that the f of x here is just, just the name of the function, but it represents the y coordinate. So we get y equals 4x cubed plus 1 over 2x cubed minus 3. Then the step that we switch from f of x to f inverse of x, we have to swap the x's with the y's. So the y will become an x, and then the, the x's will become y's. So we get x equals 4y cubed plus 1 over 2y cubed minus 3. Now, unlike the previous example, this one had multiple y's inside of the formula. So before we can start ripping away numbers attached to y's, we have to reunite the y's. They were separated by, by war. We need to combine together the family. They miss each other. Now, the y cubed in the denominator is in, it's separated by 
the y cubed kind of like by this Berlin wall here, which we call the fraction bar, uh, the vinculum is the fancy word for it. We need to get the y cubed out of the denominator. So to do that, we want to clear the denominators. On the right hand side, if we were to times both sides by 2y cubed minus 3, they would cancel out. But what's good for the goose is good for the gander. We have to do it to both sides of the equation. So we get x times 2y cubed minus 3 is equal to 4y cubed plus 1. But like our heroes often face peril when they get past one obstacle, there's another one, right? So now these parentheses are separating uh, our, our lost family members here. So in order to get the y cubed out of the parentheses, we can accomplish that by distributing the x. This would give us 2xy cubed minus 3x. This is equal to 4y cubed plus 1. And so now we're in a situation that the terms are only separated by the equal sign, which is not really a separation whatsoever. We can move the 4y cubed to the left-hand side by subtraction so that those cancel. And then we'll add the 3x to both sides to cancel out and out right there. And so then we'll see that the left-hand side has only multiples of y cubed on the, on the left. So we have the 2x y cubed that was already there. Then we move the 4y cubed to the other side. So they're on the left-hand side. The right-hand side now consists of 3x plus 1. You'll now notice that on the left-hand side, we've gathered every multiple of y. And in particular, everything on the left-hand side is a multiple of y cubed. Let's factor it out of the expression here. So we get y cubed times 2x minus 4 is equal to 3x plus 1. In which case, then to start solving the y for y here, what's attached to the y? There's this multiplication of 2x minus 4. To get rid of multiplication, we do division. So we divide both sides by 2x minus 4 so that these cancel out right here. And then, let's make that look more like a 4. And then we have what's here, y cubed, which is equal to 3x plus 1 over 2x minus 4. Well, we saw this previously. How do you get rid of the power of 3? We need to take the cube root of both sides, like so. And so this then gives us y equals the cube root of 3x plus 1 over 2x minus 4, which then would be our inverse function. f inverse of x equals the cube root of 3x plus 1 over 2x minus 4. This would then be the inverse function of that original rational function. Now, in these two examples, I looked at uh, situations where the powers of x were odd powers, like 5 and 3. This same principle would also work for even powers, but there's just a few caveats we have to worry about. We do have to restrict the domain and range so that they are one-to-one -one functions. And if ever you have to take a plus or minus, right, uh, that is, if you have to take a square root, um, because we restricted the domain, we'll only focus on the positive case. But as we'll see in the next video, when you start solving equations, we have to make sure we include both the positive and negative possibilities.